this lecture covers chapter 14, which is about sense organs. Our learning objectives today are to list the four general types of stimuli that can trigger a response from the sensory receptors. We're going to list and describe the visceral senses and we'll differentiate between superficial and central temperature sensors. Did you know you have a thermostat on the outside and on the inside? We're also going to talk about and describe the processes that contribute to nociception. What is nociception? It's pain sensitivity. We'll also describe the structure of taste buds and list and describe the special senses. We'll describe the structures and functions of the components that make up the ear and the eyeball and describe the processes that contribute to the sense of equilibrium. We'll describe the structures of the conjunctiva and eyelids, and we'll describe the origin of tears, and it's not this class, and explain how tears flow in onto and drain from the eye. General types of stimuli. We have mechanical stimuli, which is touch, hearing, and balance. We have thermal stimuli, for example, hot and cold, electromagnetic stimuli, which is what vision is, and chemical stimuli, which is taste and smell. So mechanical, thermal, electromagnetic, and chemical. Our general senses, we have visceral sensations. What is sensed? Hunger, thirst, hollow organ fullness. Those are our visceral sensations. And these are a chemical and a mechanical stimulus. Touch through touch and pressure, is a mechanical stimulus. Temperature, heat and cold, is a thermal stimulus. That makes sense. Pain is um, an intense stimuli of any of the types, and that can be chemical, uh, mechanical, or thermal. Uh, proprioception is body position and movement, and that is mechanical stimulus. What was missing from there, I'm just realizing, is vision. Vision is a, an electromagnetic stimulus. Visceral sensations, most are vague and poorly localized. So we don't know where they're really coming from. Um, when you're a kid, it's really difficult to define what you're feeling. So when you're an infant, you just cry. Something feels weird, I'm going to cry. And it's up to us to try to figure out what that sensation is for, for infants. As you get older, you might say something like, my tummy hurts. And, it, and that may actually be a sensation of hunger but you just don't characterize it as hunger because that's not, your brain just says, my tummy hurts. Um, so thirst is also a visceral sensation. Um, these are also visceral uh, sensations that include stretch receptors within the GI tract and the urinary system. So you know when you have to go to the bathroom, that's part of your visceral sensations. And if you have to go to the bathroom, go ahead and hit pause now and, and go ahead and go. You don't have to continue to listen. Touch and pressure. Sure. There's the tactile sense, which is the sensation of something being in contact with the surface of the body. And then there's pressure, which is sensation of something pressing into or on the body surface. There are different touch and pressure receptors, which provide uh, and produce sensations of light contact, deep pressure, vibration, or hair movement. So you're very sensitive to your environment as long as you pay attention to those, those uh, pressure differences. Temperature, uh, we have superficial temperature receptors, which are, are in the skin, and they detect upward and downward changes in skin temperature. So, for instance, you uh, it's fall, and it's um, been 80 degrees, and all of a sudden, it's 60 degrees. That change in temperature is what you feel, and so all of a sudden, you feel cold. Now, it's spring, and it's been 40 degrees, and now, all of a sudden, it's 60 degrees. Same temperature. But that change in the up, uh, upward or downward changes in that temperature um, will make you feel really warm. Same temperature, you either feel cold in the fall at 60 degrees or warm in the spring at 60 degrees. And those are superficial temperature receptors. We also have a central temperature receptor, which is in the hypothalamus. It monitors the temperature of the blood, and the central nervous system can then activate mechanisms, for example, sweating or piloerection, to correct hypothermia or hyperthermia. So if we have hyperthermia, the, the temperature of our blood is too hot, we will start to sweat. If we're cold, our temperature of our blood is too cold, our hypothalamus says shiver. Create those muscle contractions and uh, create heat. 
pain comes from nociceptors. Nociceptors are pain receptors. Pain receptors are widely distributed inside and on the surface of the body, but they are not present in the brain. In the brain, not on top of the brain, in the brain. Um, they may, there may be simple free nerve endings or it could be more specialized structures that detect mechanical forces, temperature, et cetera. So how do we feel pain? And this is important to realize because a lot of the diseases that we encounter cause pain and we need to know what we can do to eliminate or, or limit that pain. First of all, transduction is the conversion of the painful stimulus into a nerve impulse. Transduction occurs where the, the stimulus occurs. The, the animal has, is stepping on a pin. That pin pushes pressure into the foot and it is, there's transduction that occurs that converts that pressure into the foot, that sharp pressure into the foot, into a nerve stimulus. Transduction uh, is the conversion of the stimulus into a nerve impulse. Transmission takes the nerve impulse to the spinal cord. At the spinal cord is where we have modulation of that nerve impulse. And that takes it up to the brain where we have a conscious perception uh, within the brain. So transduction, transmission, modulation, perception. Modulation changes that sensory nerve impulse and it can amplify or suppress the sensory impulses. So there in the modulation, it can say, oh, this is really, really bad. You need to pay attention to it. Or it can say, you know what? We've seen this before. No big deal. <clears throat> Keep moving. Um, perception is that conscious awareness of the painful stimuli. Proprioception is the sense of body position and movement. There are stretch receptors in the skeletal muscles, in the tendons, ligaments, and joint capsules that sense movement of your limbs and positions of those joints, the state of contraction of the muscles, and the amount of tension being exerted on the tendons and ligaments. So this whole network of systems of stretch receptors within these places that tells you, tells your brain where your body is. If there's something wrong with our pro proprioception, we don't know the position that each of our limbs is in. That creates a, an issue for us. So back to our special senses. Um, uh, we have special senses which are, you know, more so th more than just the visceral senses, et cetera, et cetera. We have taste. What is sensed of obviously tastes. That is a chemical type of stimulus. We have smell. What is sensed? Odors. Chemical again. Hearing and equilibrium sounds and versus balance and head position are both mechanical stimuli. And then here's where the vision is. I forgot I have this in a different table. It is uh, vision senses light and it is an electromagnetic stimulus. Taste. It is a gustatory sense. There are chemical receptors or taste buds within the oral cavity. Papillae. Remember, we talked about the tongue, the oral structures within the tongue. Um, they have these small elevated structures on the tongue and also within the lining of the mouth and the pharynx. So there are taste buds all the way around. They're also called gustatory cells. And the smell, uh, and, and there are chemical things that are happening, chemical receptors that interact with the food that you are eating. Smell is an olfactory sense. It is, the, is very important in most non-human animals. Um, this is the way that dogs see the world. There are olfactory cells and supporting cells in epithelial passages or patches in the nasal pass passages. So this is olfactory epithelium. They contain nerve cells, olfactory cilia, uh, has supporting cells, and there's a mucus layer here um, that protects those olfactory cilia. There are hair-like processes that project up from the olfactory cells into the mucus layer that covers the nasal epithelium. Odor molecules dissolve in the mucus and contact the sensory processes. And these nerve impulses are generated and then travel to the brain and are interpreted or perceived as particular smells. And that's learning. A lot of that is just learning. Hearing is an auditory sense. It converts vibrations of air molecules into nerve impulses, and most structures of the ear are located in the temporal bones of the skull. I don't know if you've seen these new, I don't know how new they are, um, ear 
buds. They're not really earbuds. They don't fit in your ear. They actually uh, rest on the temporal bones just below the opening to your ear of your skull. They rest on those temporal bones because that's actually where your the structure of your ear is. And they create different types of vibrations which then go into your ear, um, not through your ear canal, which is a little convoluted, but actually into the inner ear itself, create those, vi those vibrations, um, which uh, goes through air and creates vibrations of air molecules, which are then transmitted into nerve impulses. So it's pretty cool. You actually can hear really well through these devices and you have nothing in your ear. The external ear is the part that you can feel. You pull on your earlobe, that's your external ear. It acts as a funnel. It is a funnel that collects sound wave vibrations and directs them into the eardrum. Then there's the middle ear, which amplifies and transmits the vibrations from the eardrum to the inner ear. And then the inner ear, it contains the sensory receptors that convert the mechanical vibrations to nerve impulses, along with the receptors for equilibrium sense. Here's our external ear. Um, this is the pinna. Well, this isn't ours. This is a uh, dog's. Um, and this is uh, the elastic cartilage, made of elastic cartilage and, and skin. Now, there are two layers of skin on the inside and one on the outside. And there are blood vessels and lymph vessels that lie in between. And one of the things that can happen uh, to this ear pinna is that one of the blood vessels can burst if the animal shakes its head too hard or scratches too hard. When that happens, the two layers will separate and fill with blood. And that is called an aural, A-U-R-A-L, hematoma. So that's the pinna. Um, inside that pinna, we have the external auditory canal. So it's external to the ear, and it's auditory, and it is a canal. And it's a membrane-lined tube. So it does have a very sensitive membrane. That is why I don't like it when people clean with Q-tips, because we can damage this membrane. Over time, if we have lots of infections in this um, ear, we can also thicken this membrane and close down this tube here. So we have the vertical portion and the horizontal portion of the external auditory canal. Then we have our tympanic membrane, our eardrum. It's thin connective tissue membrane that's tightly stretched across the opening between the external auditory canal and the middle ear cavity. There are sound wave vibrations. The air travels through in vibrations and it strikes the tympanic membrane and causes it to vibrate. When you look um, on the other side of the eardrum, we have three bones. And these bones are uh, made in such a way that they transmit these sounds to, directly to the um, organ of hearing. So these are small bones. They're called ossicles. There are three of them. They link the tympanic membrane with the cochlea of the inner ear. It acts as a system of levers that transmit sound wave vibrations from the tympanic membrane to the cochlea. What are the three bones? You should know this from the skeletal side. They're the incus, or the malleus, which is the mallet part that hits the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, the incus, which is in between, and the stapes, which looks like stirrups. The eustachian tube then connects that middle ear with the, ca the cavity with the pharynx. Now, it's important to have that eustachian tube because it helps to equalize air pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane. So if you have damage to the tympanic membrane, it's likely caused by increased pressure either on the inside um, of the inner ear, middle ear, or the outside. Um, so either an otitis externa or an otitis media or interna. Um, but this eustachian tube is there. Now you can clear your eustachian tube if you, you feel pressure in your ears, if you're flying or if you're swimming, you clear your, your eustachian tube by pressing your uh, nose shut and blowing, and that actually clears up your eustachian tube. It, it forces air out of your uh, middle ear and into your throat. All right, so malleus, like I said, is the outermost bone. It's attached to the tympanic membrane. Incus is in between, it's the middle bone, and the stapes is the medialmost bone. It's attached to the membrane that covers the oval window of the cochlea. Now this is, there's a lot of physics that's involved in the making of this middle ear, um, and it's an incredible little organ that allows um, hearing 
uh, allows us to hear very specific things. It's pretty incredible. So the cochlea is the shell-shaped spiral cavity in the temporal bone. Okay, so it kind of looks like a snail shell. Within that is the organ of corti. It's the fluid-filled portion that makes up the receptor organ of hearing. So if we're looking at this, okay, here is the, the cochlea, looks like a snail shell. And we have our oval window, which is in contact with the stapes. We also have a round window. So these are two different shaped windows that will take in different vibrations at different frequencies. We also have these semicircular canals and a vestibule that leads from this, oval, or this cochlea and the organ of corti into the, um, this area here. So the sound comes through here and into this cochlea. Right, so it's it's a spiral, and the, the sound waves travel through there. And what happens is that um, they go through the cochlear duct, and they, um, they come into contact with these microvilli. Um, the vibrations hit these villi, which is part of this hair cell within your ears, and it contacts the nerve endings of the cochlear nerve. Those nerve endings of the cochlear nerve then go through uh, into the brain. Okay, so it's a cranial nerve. So we go from a mechanical thing um, into a uh, nerve impulse. It's creating a uh, stimulus. That organ of corti will run along that cochlear duct on the basal or membrane, the base membrane, and it consists of hair cells, which are the hearing receptors, supporting cells. We all always need our um, posse, our supporting cells, and the tectorial membrane. The sound wave vibrations cause the tympanic membrane and ossicles in the middle ear to vibrate, which causes vibration of fluid around that cochlear duct. That fluid vibration causes the cochlear duct to move, and this causes the tectorial membrane and the hair cells of the organ of corti to rub up against each other, which generates that nerve impulse that travels to the brain and is interpreted as sound. So it's, it sounds really complicated, but it's very, very cool. Different frequencies of sound wave vibrations stimulate different areas along the length of the organ of corti. That's why it is shaped the way that it is, because different frequencies will hit at different points along that spiral. Okay, so we have uh, sound coming in. We have vibration coming in. It hits and vibrates this tympanic membrane, which moves these uh, ossicles, which hits um, and the and the it will go through here as well through the um, uh, we'll have some movement through the round window but most of this will go through the oval window it will hit uh, and go in here and it will hit at different points within this spiral and then the air will move out and um, at this point it moves out the round window here's the eustachian tube which helps to um, equalize the pressure within this uh, area here. Pretty cool. Um, equilibrium is also a part of this. It's the mechanical sense. It helps to maintain balance by keeping track of the position and movements of the head. It involves equilibrium receptors and information for both the eyes and the proprioceptors. So it's taking in all of this information. The receptors are located in the vestibule in the semicircular canals within the inner ear. So here's the vestibule, and we have semicircular canals here. Between the cochlea and the semicircular canal, canals lie that vestibule. It's composed of two things, the utricle and the saccule. So here's the utricle, here's the saccule, and here are semicircular, look, they're semicircular canals, okay? The hair, there are hair cells that are covered by a gelatinous matrix that contain crystals of calcium carbonate, or otoliths. These are stones in your ear. They're teeny tiny little stones in your head. You have rocks in your head and you didn't even know it. These are within the utricle and the saccule, and these are really important. What happens is gravity pushes down on these little otoliths, okay? These are little stones, rocks in your head, rocks in your ears, and that causes a pressure on the gelatinous matrix and on certain hairs. And these hairs are lined up in a pattern so that when any movement of the head happens, it bends those sensory hairs in a certain pattern, which generates nerve impulses that give the brain information about the position of your head. 
I think this is really cool. I hope you agree with me. All right, then these semicircular canals. These are also located opposite uh, the vestibule from the cochlea. They're in the inner ear, and they contain fluid-filled membranous tubes. And there are ampulla, or enlarged areas, that are near the utricle end of this, each semicircular canal. So this is the ampulla. They're kind of little bulbs. And here's the semicircular canal. Now, it's the way that fluid moves through these semicircular canals that adjusts the way that these things um, hit these hair cells. So within that ampulla, there's something called the crista ampullaris, which is a receptor, and it has supporting cells and hair cells with modified dendrites that stick up in that gelatinous structure in the cupula. When the head moves, that fluid movement lags behind the movement of the canal itself, and the movement of the fluid pulls on the cupula and bends the hairs, which generates nerve impulses that gives the brain information about the motion of the head. So depending on how you bend your head, move your head, your brain knows where your head is at all times because of the way the fluid moves. It's all physics going on. Pretty cool. All right, moving on to vision. Most components of the eye function to help form an accurate visual image, but not detect it. Photoreceptors that detect the image and generate visual nerve impulses are in a single layer of cells in the retina. So we're going to have everything in the eye helps to form that image, but there's only photoreceptors that actually detect it. Here are the layers of the eyeball. We have an outer fibrous layer. So the outer part of the uh, eyeball is fibrous. It's pretty tough. It takes a lot to poke through an eyeball. Not that much, but a fair amount. The sclera is the white part of the back part of the eye. Okay, if you see the whites of somebody, somebody's eyes, that means that you are very close to them, and that is composed of the sclera. Okay, the the um, the outer fibrous layer that is clear is the cornea. Okay, that's the part you see through. So the rest of it is called the sclera. We have a middle vascular layer, and we have an inner nervous layer. So there are three layers of the eyeball before you get into the ball itself, the center of the ball. The cornea and the sclera. The cornea is transparent. Like I said, it admits light to the interior of the ear, eye. It's the arrangement um, of collagen fibers in a very um, uh, parallel system. It's not a lot of crossing. You don't have any blood vessels there. So it, that's what helps it remain transparent. Now, because there are no blood vessels in the cornea, that means that when it gets scratched, it takes a little bit longer to heal. Tears help to carry nutrients across the cornea, not blood vessels. The sclera, or the white of the eye, has dense fibrous connective tissue. You can't see through it. The limbus is that junction between the cornea and the sclera, and it's important that we define that because at some point, you actually we, we may be using that to describe a lesion. The eyeball has a middle vascular layer, meaning it has lots of blood vessels. There's, uh, it's, the choroid is between the sclera and the retina. So in the back of the eye, we have the choroid. choroid. It has the pigment and blood vessels uh, within the eye. In most animals, the choroid forms the tapetum, which is the highly reflective area in the rear of the eye. That tapetum, the tapetum lucidum, is the reflective um, surface that you see when you shine um, a flashlight at night and you see eye shine uh, back at you. And we don't have it in our human eyes, but in most animals, especially those that hunt at night, that tapetum lucidum creates another source of uh, light because it reflects any light that comes into it. Then we have the iris, which is the pigmented muscular diaphragm that controls the amount of light um, that enters the posterior portion of the eyeball. The pupil is the opening at the center of those iris. It is a pigmented muscular diaphragm, so that's what gives you your different eye colors. The ciliary body is a muscular um, structure. It's a ring-shaped um, structure just behind the iris, and it has it, those muscles that adjust the shape of the lens to allow us to see, to focus um, at near for near things and far vision. So if you're nearsighted, um, it, it will adjust uh, very well for you to be able to see 
things close up. If you're farsighted, it adjusts very well for you to see far away, but the opposite is not necessarily very true. All right, so on the retina, this is the this line, this is the inner nervous layer. It lines the back of the eye and it contains the sensory receptors for vision, which are the rods and the cones. Between the um, layers of the eye, we have a space. And it, within that space, it's called the aqueous compartment. Um, the aqueous compartment is, is the front part of the eye. It's subdivided in by the iris um, into the anterior, which is in the front of the eye, and the posterior, which is in the back um, behind the iris, but in front of the lens. This contains a clear watery fluid. We call that the aqueous humor. It's produced in the posterior chamber by the cells of the ciliary body. So there are cells within the ciliary body that produce a fluid that help to coat the lens and the iris and create a certain amount of pressure to keep that eyeball um, uh, expanded into a globe. Then there is the vitreous compartment, which has a clear, I'm sorry, clear gelatinous fluid. It's called vitreous humor. The vitreous humor fills the whole back of the eyeball behind the lens and the ciliary body. So when you think of that globe in the front, in front of the lens, there's a, the lens is a is a line, and in front of the lens there's a very clear liquidy thing called aqueous humor, and back behind the lens there's the clear gelatinous fluid called the vitreous humor. The lens it consists of layers of fibers. Um, it is elastic, so it's movable and is biconvex, which means it, it pushes out on both um, in both the front and the rear. The front surface is in contact with aqueous humor and the back surface is co in contact with vitreous humor. This helps to focus a clear image on the retina. By accommodating, accommodation is the process by which the shape of the lens is changed to allow either close up or distant vision. Relaxation of the ciliary muscles causes tension on suspensory ligaments. So when the ciliary muscles relax, that will flatten the lens. When the ciliary muscles contract, it releases tension on the, ciliary, on the suspensory ligaments and it allows that lens to, um, to become rounder in the middle. The retina is multi-layered and it lines most of that uh, back vitreous compartment. There's a pigmented layer um, that is uh, in contact with the vitreous humor. There is then a photoreceptor layer, which are your rods and your cones, and then a bipolar cell layer, and then a ganglion cell layer, and then a layer of nerve fibers. So here is our pigmented retina. Here are our photoreceptor cells, and there's the rod and the cone. And then we have our bipolar cells and our ganglion cells, and then these fibers that join all the ganglions and connect to the optic nerve. The optic disc is the site on the back of the eye where the nerve fibers on the inside surface of the retina all converge and leave the disc, the eye. We can actually see that optic disc if we look at the back of the eye with an ophthalmoscope. That is the one place that we can see directly into the nervous system without opening up the animal. The photoreceptor cells are neurons with modified dendrites. So rods are more sensitive to light, whereas cones are more sensitive to color and detail. So rods are more sensitive to light, cones, the triangular shape, more sensitive to color and detail. Outside the eye, the conjunctiva is a thin transparent membrane that covers the front portion of the eyeball and lines the interior surfaces of the eyelids. And the, there is a sac in between the eyeball and the eyelids called the conjunctival sac, which is that space between the bulbar or the eyeball and the palpebral or eyelid portions of the conjunctiva. So here is our conjunctiva on the eyeball comes out and forms a sac and then wraps up to the eyelid. Eyelids, um, there are upper and lower folds of skin and they're lined by a thin, moist conjunctiva. There are lateral and medial canthi or canthuses 
um, this is the medial canthus, this is the lateral canthus, this is toward the nose, this is toward the outside of the head. The tarsal glands, there are tarsal glands that produce a waxy substance that helps prevent tears from overflowing onto the face. So there are a couple different types of tears. Lacrimal glands produce kind of a uh, more of a watery tear and tarsal glands produce more of a waxy substance that keeps, helps to um, build a little bit of a waxy wall that keeps the, the watery the substance in, in place. The lacrimal apparatus are structures that produce and secrete tears and drain them away, away from the surface. There's also a lacrimal sac and a nasolacrimal duct that goes into the nose. And that's why you sniffle when you cry, because there are tears that go from your eyes into your nose. There are also muscles. Remember how many nerves innervate and create motor uh, eye movement? Well, there are a lot of muscles that attach uh, to the eye so that you can move your eye in lots of different directions. They attack, attach actually to the sclera of the eye, capable of a wide range of movements, there are dorsal, ventral, two medial, or a medial and a lateral, so medial and lateral rectus muscles. That means they're straight. And then there are dorsal and ventral oblique muscles. And the cool thing is that they come over and go through a trochlea, kind of like a pulley system. Um, and it, it changes the direction in which you can turn your eyes. So dorsal, ventral, medial, and lateral, four different rectus muscles and two different oblique dorsal and ventral oblique muscles. That's the end of our lecture. I uh, just want to know if you have any questions, please bring them.